Welcome, 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 welcome back. It's your boy Bojack, and I'm back with another glass. Uh, welcome, guys, back to the winery. I hope that you have had a great week. I hope you enjoyed last week last week's episode. My tongue is heavy already. This is crazy. Um, forgive me, I ain't get my hair done in a while, so the Dewey is on. Uh, but the locks are still intact. Don't worry. They still here as long as ever. Anyway, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed last week's episode as much as I did. I enjoyed it a little too much. A little too, too much. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I drank the entire bottle last week. I will not be doing that this week. Don't worry. If you were worried about me last week, you should have been. But if you're worried about me drinking a whole bottle this week, Ain't going to happen. Don't worry. I could pour a whole bottle, but I ain't going to drink a whole bottle. There's that. Um, I ain't even going to pour a whole bottle this week. This week, we're going to drink a, a glass, a nice, classy glass, a nice five-ounce pour. We might do a little more than five ounces, but we're going to do what we do around here in the winery. Uh, without further ado, let's get into it. Okay, this week, we have Sun Goddess wine. And let me tell you about this wine because it is March and it is Women's History Month. And the beauty about this this wine is that it was made. It's Mary J. Blige's wine line. Now, when I went in the store and got it, when I picked it out, I literally only picked it out because of this little gold seal. If you can see there, it has a black woman in the middle. And I said, oh, that looks like a black lady. Now, I like black women. They're my favorites. Just throwing that out there. Um, and I picked this, not even paying attention to the fact that it's Mary J. Blige's wine. You all know, you know, you know Mary J. Blige. Good morning, God. to her. This is her wine, and I love Mary J. Blige. I've been a Mary J. Blige fan for a very, very long time since, like, what's the 411? If you don't know what's the 411, you're probably too young to be here. You should probably go elsewhere. Uh, what's the 411 was, like, her first album. Dope album. Doesn't get nearly enough shine. Anyway, let's open her up. And see what it's all about. It's a Point Gregorio. Uh, some of y'all call it Pinot Grigio. I call it a Point Gregorio. Uh, it has an actual cork in it, and I love that. I hate wine that has terrible, um, terrible corks. The plastic corks are the freaking worst. They're hard to open, and they break a lot. So then you end up with cork inside your wine glass. Awful. Okay. Y'all know we came for last week's pop was loud. We probably not going to get one that loud with this one, but let's see. Hold on. It's close. It's close. It's close. Hold on. Nope. Told you we weren't going to get one that loud. That was barely one at all, but whatever. The wine will hopefully still be good. Um, it's 12.5% alcohol. I read it ahead of time. I didn't have to look for it this time. I've been having to look for it, y'all. And that's the rough part. Uh, we have our cork holder now. That's my favorite one now because it has the MJB in the middle. Oh, oh no. It has the MJB in the middle. It's backwards, but whatever. Oh, it has it on both sides. That's dope. There you go. That's better. Um, so that'll be my favorite cork from here on out until I find one that's cooler than that. We have our liquid receptacle. We still not have named her. Put name suggestions down in the comment section. Also, while you're here, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Please share. There are 54 of us in here, and if we can get 54 more people to watch, you know what I'm saying, we break 100. I want to at least break 100 subscribers by the end of this year. Um, I know this YouTube thing can be slow, but that's what I want to do. I want to get to 100 subscribers by the end of this year. So like, subscribe, share, comment, suggest. Do whatever you got to do. I appreciate y'all. We're going to get a nice pour. I'm doing this with fear and trembling because my laptop is underneath it. That's it. Okay? That's all we're doing today. We're not doing no more than that. But it's called Sun Goddess, um, which is pretty cool because we know that black women and black people especially are god gods and goddesses of the sun. Um, we absorb the sun because of the melanin in our skin. Um, 
those 2520s don't necessarily do that. Um, and if you are a 2520, we love you all the same. Um, however, the sun gives y'all cancer and burns y'all up. It doesn't do the same to us. <laughs> um, so, well, moving right along, we're going to get into raising our glass here at the winery. If you're new, we raise our glass to somebody who's done something incredible in the past, present, or, you know, hopefully in the future. We, we, we try to attempt to do that every once in a while. We have not yet, but we will. And this week in the winery, we are raising our, our glass to the one and only Celia Cruz. If you do not know, because March is also Music History Month, if you didn't know. So it's Women's History Month and Music History Month, History Month, and last month, February, was Black History Month. So I love women. I love black women. I love music. Three of my favorite things, all in one. Celia Cruz is a Cuban woman, but she's very dark skinned, very much a black Cuban woman, uh, Afro Latina woman, if you will. Um, Celia Cruz, she got a whole bunch of names. Her real name is Ursula. I would have went by Celia too. Um, born October twenty first, nineteen twenty five, in Havana, Cuba. Um, she goes on to. Uh, attend Havana's National Conservatory of Music, where she studied voice, theory, and piano. Singing because singing became a huge part of her life at a young age, often singing for tourists, her siblings at cabarets. Uh, she attended her she attended with her cousins. Now I just read that just now. Y'all know I'm dyslexic. Super dyslexic. So reading ain't never been my thing. I don't mind doing it, but you know, nigga got to read it time after time after time after time to get it. So for me to get it on the first try, applaud me. <laughs> um, however, Celia Cruz, of course, has passed on. But um, one of my favorite songs by her is uh, La Negra Ten Tiene Tumbao. I probably said it wrong, but it sounded right. And that's what's important. Uh, my accent is uh, shaky. My Spanish is less than shaky. It's horrible. But I love that song. Uh, it's about black women. It's an ode to black women, which is really dope um, and how she loves black women. So this year, Celia Cruz is going to and she's known as the Queen of Salsa. But also this year, she's going to be featured on the back, if I'm not mistaken, of the U.S. quarter. Um, so I support that. I hope that I come across that quarter at some point or I have to purchase it. If I have to purchase it, that's fine. But hopefully at some point I come across that quarter and I'm able to say that I have a Celia Cruz quarter. So we raise our glasses to you, Miss Celia Cruz Azucar. That's really good. Sorry, guys. Don't mean to yell. That's really good. I drink a lot of Point Gregorio in my day, and it's very grapey, and not in a bad way. It's pretty sweet. Wow, I could drink this entire bottle. 12.5% alcohol is quite a bit, but I could absolutely drink this entire bottle and probably be okay with that, with the fact that I did it. Last week I did it, I had to pull myself together before I continued the day. It was not great. It was not a great idea at all, um, but here we are again. It's very, very good. Um, the alcohol taste is not super duper strong. It's it's very smooth. Good job, Mary. And the other guy that did this with Mary, because she had a guy that owns a, a grape orchard. And so they did this together. But that's phenomenal. I'm going to blame it all on Mary because it's great. If it wasn't great, yes, I would have blamed it on someone else or whoever the other guy is that she worked with on this project. Um, moving right along. Hallelujah. I'm going to stop doing that one day, y'all, because hallelujah don't go on the end of everything. But some days it does. So moving along, the NAACP Image Awards was this week, and a lot of great things came out of it, including the one, the only, Kevin Allen Fredericks, known as Kev on stage, won for best person, best social media personality. He won his very first. He was nominated three times. This was the third time he won his very first NAACP Image Award. I voted. I voted several times from several different emails several days in a row. So if he didn't get it, 
I was going to be pissed off too. Excuse me. I'm not supposed to be burping this week. This is not a sparkling wine or a champagne. So I should not be burping this week. Sorry about that last week. I tried to cut out as much as I possibly could, but there wasn't that much I could do about it. Um, because I had drank so much, I couldn't help it. So congratulations to Kev on stage. Congratulations to Tab, whom I both love. You see them featured here. Um, you see both of their products featured here. Um, she also won for Tab Time, which is her YouTube children's show that all the kids and quite honestly, a few adults, quite a few adults love her show. Along with those two wins, uh, Dwayne Wade and Gabrielle Union both won um, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. They both won an award. They both won the NAACP Image Award. I don't remember the category. I do apologize because what I do remember more than anything is the captivating speech that Dwayne Wade gave as he uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Dedicated his speech to his daughter Zaya Wade, and we'll listen to it, just a little bit of it. To publicly speak to our daughter Zaya. Zaya, as your father, all I've wanted to do is get it right. I've sat back and watched how gracefully you take it on the public, the public scrutiny, and even though it's not easy, I watched you walk out of that house every morning as yourself. I admire how you've handled the ignorance in our world. I admire it, that you face every day. To say that your village is proud of you is an understatement. Thank you for showing me that there's more than just one way to communicate effectively. You taught me that communication with my mouth isn't enough. I have to also communicate with my two ears and my two eyes. As your father, my job isn't to create a, a version of myself or direct your future. My role is to be a facilitator to your hopes, your wishes, your dreams. So, of course, he goes on to say more and Gabrielle Union goes on to give her part of the speech as well, to which she speaks to the entire LGBTQIA community or speaks to, you know, um, the communities of cis het gender cis cis heterosexual gendered people um to stand up for the lgbtqia plus community um but this spoke to me more than anything in the world no be not because i'm gay because i'm not not a gay man i am an ally however though and because i am an ally this spoke to me on so many levels because you think that just because you don't bash gay people, you don't use the F word as it pertains to gay men, you don't use the D word as it pertains to gay women and so on and so forth, just because you don't use those slurs against them or at all, that you are actually doing something. And while that is great progress and you are kind of doing your part, uh, standing in it with them looks a lot different. And just being physical doesn't, it just, doesn't do it anymore. It just doesn't cut it. You have to use your voice. You have to listen to the concerns and needs and the values and the understandings of other people. You have to see with your eyes what they are actually going through and then make a perception on your own or come up with an opinion on your own or come up with an action plan on your own to be better and do better. More importantly, what I saw here is something that I've always saw from Dwayne Wade in this sense of a father protecting his child. Regardless of what the world believes or regardless of what the world thinks of Zaya Wade, this man is simply protecting his child. Um, Tabitha Brown gave an interview with her daughter Choice on the red carpet uh, of the NAACP Image Awards where she said, this is her child. This is not her property. She is not her property. All she can do is guide her child in the way that she should go. It is not up to us as parents to think for our children and make them be who we want them to be, but who they want to be. And let's just focus on making them good people pretty much. And I'm paraphrasing, of course, because y'all know my rememberer don't be remembering things all the way like it's supposed to. So take everything I say with a grain of salt and go do the research for your absolute self. I 110% agree that you should go look for yourself. Um, but Dwayne Wade did an incredible job, as he always does, of standing in the way of ignorance as it regards to what people say and think and feel about his daughter. Um, 
You don't have to understand people. You don't have to even agree with them. All you have to do is show them the same kind of respect that they show you. And that's what I do as an ally. I do not take my position as an ally um, for granted. I take it very, very seriously because unfortunately there are trans women, trans men, there are non-binary people out there being murdered simply for being who they are. And we'll even get a little personal if you want to. I was a child who was not allowed to be myself around grown people because nobody protected me. Every, any and everything I did was perceived as, you know that boy got sugar in his tank. He gonna have sugar in his tank. He gonna be gay. You better watch him. He could be probably a little sugary, probably a little okay. night when I wasn't. I was simply raised by women. A whole, 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 whole lot of women. And so because of that, I portrayed what I saw. I had an attitude like a girl. I moved like, because I was, not only was I around grown women, all of my cousins were girls. So I wasn't watching sports. I played football, but that's really it. That was the only time I was around other guys, but I couldn't hang out with them outside of football practice. I wasn't allowed to go to the coach's house to kick it with his sons and so on and so forth. But I never heard, and I'm, I could be wrong, but I never heard with my own two ears anyone say, leave him alone and let him be him. He's not hurting anyone. He sings with a little bit of an attitude. That's cool. We're going to turn that into something one day. Never heard those words. Never felt protected by any person, you know, ever really. I knew that I couldn't be physically harmed. Because then I would be protected. But I was not protected emotionally. And that's no dagger to my mom, my sisters, anybody else, you know, that that was in my life growing up. Nobody else that had a hand in raising me. That wasn't this is not that this is not a dagger. I'm not downing them because I don't even think at the time they knew. But my mom had gay friends. My mom loved gay men. That was her. Those were her people. She never downed them. She never talked bad about them. She always accepted people for who they were. So my mother was never one of the people who would talk down about or say negative things in regards to the way that I acted. I learned how to skip when I was a kid, right? Sounds innocent enough because you're a kid skipping. That's what you want your kids to do until someone sees it and perceives it as, well, you skip like a girl, which is absurd. And then your sexuality is called into question. You hear it. I played with dolls as a kid. Nobody paid attention to these dolls. Yes, I played with dolls. There was spit in their hair. There was gum in their hair. Usually they were burnt or missing a piece of some kind because they were being terrorized. Funny story. My mama. God rest her soul, an amazing woman. But she didn't want us to tear up our toys when we was kids. So if we, when we got toys for Christmas... She would let us pick one out and then she would box the rest of them up and hide them, put them in the closet, put them in the basement, wherever else. And so and it was simply out of you're not going to tear up all your toys at once or at all, if I can help it. Um, unfortunately, in 1995, we had a large flood and my toys got flooded out in the basement. So after that, I stopped asking for toys. I always ask for clothes or shoes or whatever. Uh, stuff that I was already getting is what I would typically ask for. But I say all that to say this. It is not our jobs as a parent, and I'm not telling anybody how to parent their child. I'm saying for me, it is not our job as parents to make our kids be someone they're not. It is only our job to love them as who they are and steer them into being good, wholesome people if we can. To not be negative Nancys, to not be... Uh, inconsiderate people to not be homophobic. If you're heterosexual, that's cool. If you're homosexual, cool, whatever. My only job as a parent is to love you for who you are and accept you for who you are, most importantly, but also teach you how to treat people, teach you how to love people, teach you how to meet people where they are, teach you that everybody is not your enemy. 
Also, who you lay down with is none of my business. When you are old enough to make the decision to allow someone to be in your bed with you in your home, it is none of my business who that person is. It is only my business that they treat you right. It's only my business that they love you correctly. It is only my business. I have all girls. So it's only my business to make sure that that person is in your life for positive reasons. And if they're not, that is when I will voice my opinion. Other than that, I'm going to shut up. If you safe and you loved, there are no concerns here. Everything ain't perfect. Every day ain't sunshine and rainbows. So you can't expect that. Uh, moving along. Thank you, Dwayne Wade, for being a great parent, for standing up for your child the way that children are supposed to be stood up for, because 10 times out of 10, they can't stand up for themselves. So moving along, Deion Sanders, right? We're going to drink a little bit more because I spoke a lot. So let me drink a lot. The more I drink, the heavier my tongue get. And it don't always call. You know, I try to talk fast. I don't really try to talk fast, but I get nervous, even though I know ain't nobody in the room but me. There's people in the room with me now. But there's nobody here. You guys aren't here. The 54 of us, 55 of us that are here, y'all ain't here watching me. But I still get nervous. So the more I drink, the heavier my tongue get, the slower I talk. So it'd be cool. Um, Deion Sanders was doing an interview on a sports show of some kind, and he decided to talk about his uh, process and understanding of recruitment and how it works. And we'll listen to a little clip about that. Bags, the difference. Yeah. We want mother, father, you know, dual parent. Mm -hmm. We want that kid to be three, five and up. He's got to be smart. Mm -hmm. um, not bad decisions off the field uh, at all mm -hmm. because he has to be a leader of men. Like, like old linemen, I look for dual parent homes. Right. A strong father that they adhere uh, to. Right. Um, smart kid, three, at least three, three and above. Lime, a defense lineman is totally opposite. What do you mean? Single mama. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Trying to get it. <laughs> yeah, he's on free lunch. I mean, like, uh, I mean, I'm talking about just trying to make it. He's trying to rescue mom quarterbacks. So, what he said was when he's recruiting quarterbacks, he looks for someone who is a leader, who has a 3.5 GPA, who makes good decisions on and off the field, comes from a two parent household, and, you know, is a, a born leader, a built leader. He goes on to say that he does not look for the same thing in a defensive lineman. He wants them to be from a rural community, from, you know, he wants them to be from a broken home, a single parent household. He's trying to rescue his mom, so on and so forth. He There's a whole thing about it um, on the YouTubes. He's on the Rich Eisen show. I've never heard of it before, but that's what show he's on. And my immediate thought about this as an offensive and defensive lineman from a broken household, um, my immediate thought about this was, oh, you, you want the black kids to protect the white kids. But he didn't say that. I went and I watched the entire interview and he never brought up necessarily race or class or any, well, no, I mean, this is a classist conversation for sure, but he didn't bring those things up. But we all can get the the subtext or the the clues in regards to what it is he's talking about and i took issue with it and i still kind of take issue with it in the sense of why is it why is it that that old lineman and that d lineman also can't be leaders why can't they also come from two parent households because having a family member who is now in the nfl who has played college football and he played uh, high school football and little league football and so on and so forth because his father was in his life is in his life and he came from a two-parent household he's a monster also he's an incredible leader so and he's a defensive player he's not a d lineman but he's a defensive player he's a monster on that field and i don't say that just because he's related to me i say that because he's actually talented he actually has the skill and the talent and the leadership and the smarts he, I mean, you know what I'm saying? He did. He has done an incredible job over the years to make himself what he is. 
but he did it with a two parent household. And it's not that Dion is completely wrong because the boys who are in the hood, because the boys in the hood are always, sorry, my dyslexic, my ADHD, sorry, not, that's not dyslexic, that's ADHD. But the boys who are in the hood, the guys who are, they have grown up in rural communities, they come from a single parent household, usually mom. Dad was never around, or if he was around, there was some kind of issue, blah, blah, blah. They do play harder because they have a point to prove, but also they are trying to get out of a bad situation that could become even worse, or they're trying to get their mom or their little brother or their aunt and so on, their grandmothers, just like Shannon Sharp. Shannon Sharp grew up in a shack with 13 other people, if I'm not mistaken, a two-bedroom shack, and all he wanted to do was get his grandma out of that house. And if you ever look at Shannon Sharp's tapes from back in the day, Shannon Sharp was a beast. He was a monster. He still is, honestly. At 55 years old, dude is big. And he still works out like he got something to prove, even though he don't. And his brother had already made it to the NFL, and he still had the hunger, the want, the feel, the need of, I got to get my grandma out of this house. I got to get her out of this shack that don't have a bathroom. She pissing and shitting in a bucket in the backyard, and I got to get her out of that. So for him to say that that's what he's looking for in a D lineman versus a quarterback, it's a little bit understanding in that aspect. But the breakdown is when across NFL football, uh, college football, high school football, the black quarterbacks – don't get recruited as much because they come from single parent households, regardless of what their GPAs are. Like, oh, he got a he he's got a single mom. Nah, we good. We he 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 got in trouble two weeks ago. Nah, we good. We not gonna save his life. We're gonna let him be. We're gonna let him keep making dumb decisions. We're not gonna walk into his life and change it. We're not gonna help him along the way because he's a sophomore or junior or even a senior in high school. And, you know, every once in a while he makes dumb decisions, not paying attention to the fact that all of those dumb decisions are not his own. I work at a children's facility, a psychiatric facility for kids, and we sometimes get these teenagers who are just in bad situations. They are just in bad situation. The neighborhoods that they grow up in, unfortunately, have uh, influences around them by other adults who are encouraging them to make bad decisions instead of making good ones. Excuse me. Sometimes that can be the difference. The difference is somebody coming in saying, hey, we not about to we not going to let you do this. You have a talent, so we. I'm not going to let you go rob this house or steal out of this car or so on and so forth. I'm not going to let you make dumb decisions. You're struggling in school, I'm going to be the one to help you. I may not know everything, but I know that somebody at that school knows something. They know more than I do, so I'm going to be the one to help you. Nobody wants to take that responsibility. And being a product of someone who had, who never had somebody necessarily make that decision, I, I'll tell anybody, my sister, my sister sacrificed her life for me because my father didn't want to. I salute her for the rest of my days for that. As long as I draw breath in my life, in my body, I will be able to say that my sister dropped everything and took care of me from an infant because we had a father that did not want to. So it's not that I didn't have any support. I don't want y'all to think that, oh, he was just left in the cold and blah, blah, blah. No, I was taken care of, but Y'all also got to understand my sister was 19 when I was born. She should have never been taken. She had already taken care of my brother. So she should have never had to take care of two kids. She had taken care of my brother from the time he was born. And she was nine years old when he was born. 11 years later, she's 19. And here I come. My mama couldn't wait six weeks to go back to work. She had to go back to work after two weeks. Ain't nobody here but her, my sister, to take care of us. So she did. So I'll salute her for the rest of my days because of that. But no male in my life said, you are making dumb life decisions, kid. But you are humongous at your age and you got quick feet. So I'm going to make sure that you become the best lineman in the world. I'm going to make sure that even if you decide that you don't want to play NFL football, you do something with your life. Nobody ever told me I had to go to college. I wanted to go to college because I grew up in the 90s. And in the 90s, having a college degree made a difference. It made you prestigious in a way. 
You had standards. It was easier to get a job, a high paying job. My degree don't mean nothing right now today. It means squat. I have a bachelor's of science in psychology and minor in child and family studies. It means squat. Nobody cares. You are better off getting a trade. Just saying. But I will get down off my soapbox as it regards to single parent households and children who play sports. And we will move right along. You know, we can't move along without drinking. Got to drink a little something. This is really good. It's really, really good. Moving on. Y'all remember when Chris Rock got smacked, right? He got smacked by Will Smith. Because Will Smith told him, keep my wife's name out your mouth. Y'all know what he said. He said an expletive. I'll say it. You know, he said, keep my wife's name out your fucking mouth. That's what he said. Now, I don't be doing all that extraness on this here channel. Because, uh, you know, people be watching. Thank you for watching. But after a year... It, this happened at the Oscars in front of a room full of white folks. So, uh, after a year, Chris Rock has decided that he was going to say something. He got a, a, a Netflix special that was released, apparently. I haven't watched it. Um, I haven't really supported Chris Rock since he allowed uh, that red-headed white man to call him a nigga and was okay with it. Um, I forgot that man's name. He was apparently the writer of Pootie Tang, and so because of that, I guess Chris Rock thought it was okay to call it, let him call him a nigga or whatever. I guess they were friends like that. I have white friends, and none of them use the N-word out of respect for me, and because of that, I appreciate them. Um, yeah, hopefully, here soon, you guys will get to meet them. <laughs> um, so Chris Rock finally, I guess, gets his revenge of some kind or he got a chance to talk about it in his Netflix special. But what he said was the most ignorant thing that could have been said about anything ever as a black person. Um, his quote was, I watched Emancipation to see Will Smith get whipped. That's some weak shit if I ever heard it, because you can't whoop him. You wanted to see his character get whipped. Now, if you've seen Emancipation... Uh, I've seen it. It's an incredible movie. Honestly, if you 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 watch the movie and you forget that it's in black and white, Will Smith did an incredible job of of, of being in this um, this role of a slave who had escaped and ended up back not in slavery, but in some kind of like indentured servitude where he was working in a um, mine to build railroads for trains, and he eventually escaped. Now, in our history books. We've all seen the picture of the man who's a slave with his hand on his hip and his back is torn to shreds. We've all seen that. Um, if you haven't seen it, go look it up. It's an incredible story. The picture is breathtaking. And that was the whole point of it. Um, in the end, and this is spoiler alert, in the end of the movie, uh, Will Smith makes it to Abe Lincoln's uh, because Abe had freed the slaves. So he did all this fighting and all this running to get to Abe Lincoln's, um, his tent, so to speak, for his warriors and the soldiers. So he, you know, they, that's where slaves were running to so they could be free. He made it. And when he got there, they were telling the stories of the slave or they were asking the story, asking the slaves about their time as slaves so that they could tell their story. Um, and long story short, Will goes in to take his picture or the slave guy. He goes in. I forget his name. I'm sorry. He goes in to take his picture and he takes his shirt off and he turns his back and it even takes the photographer. You know, it takes his breath away to see it in person. Um, because there were whips and big uh, scars on his back uh, from being whipped. So, And so for Chris Rock to say such a thing, such an insensitive thing in regards to what his own people have been through, like that is wild to say out loud. Like you you watched it so you could see him get whipped all because you, you weak and you can't whip it. I'm assuming that's the reason why you decided to say such an ignorant thing, uh, because it's not funny. I haven't. It's just not. It's not funny. 
Um, but that's my assumption is that you are weak and you decided that because you can't whip him, I'll just watch his character get whipped, even though somebody actually felt that pain. So, excuse me, somebody actually inflicted that pain on another man simply because he's black, simply because his skin is as dark as yours. That is terrible. It's terrible to think. It is also quite terrible to say out loud. But, you know, again, I'm not a not necessarily a Chris Rock fan. I don't dislike dude. I'm just not a super fan of his like that. Um, I think it's very insensitive. I think it is also very ignorant and quite honestly, a little cowardice of him to, to say such a thing. Uh, Will Smith has apologized several times over in regards to slapping Chris on a public platform. I don't think he should apologize. I think he should smack his ass again. Um, I think he needs to be hit in the mouth a couple of times just so he can be more aware of the things that he says, because he clearly doesn't, he doesn't watch his mouth. And I've seen comedians, I've seen uh, several comedians go, you know, it's just the crab that nothing's off limits and we can say what we want to say and that's the crab, blah, blah, blah. But I've also seen or heard a genius comedian by the name of Cat Williams say out loud, if you cannot create a comedy set without hurting people, then 10 times out of 10, you're not a good comedian. If you can't create a comedy set without being a uh, crass or ignorant or anything like that, or, or simply attacking a certain people or being insensitive. If you can't create a comedy set, an hour set around what's going on now, you can't say the R word no more. You can't say the D word as it regards to, to gay women. You can't say the F word as it regards to gay men, so on and so forth. If you can't create a comedy special or a comedy hour or a, or a fire comedy, just a joke in general, Without having to include those things, then chances are you're not that good of a comedian. And the reason why I gravitate towards comedians such as Kevin on stage is because he absolutely is able to do that. He's a situational comedian. I don't know if that's a real thing or maybe I definitely just made it up in my head. But he's a comedian that goes based off of the times now and what's going on now. And he doesn't make jokes about people or situate or, or not not situations. He doesn't make jokes about any group of people or any any one thing that any group of people can identify with so that nobody gets hurt. And I like that because he's still hilarious. He is absolutely hilarious. So again, salute to Kev on stage for being an incredible thinker and being smart about things and being able to create a comedy set, several comedy sets now that does not hurt anyone or a specific group of people. Um, that being said, this concludes another wine bottle. Here in the winery, we thank you. I appreciate you guys for being here. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share, comment. Tell all your friends, go get a glass of wine and have a glass with me. Until next time, I absolutely love you guys.